Hi everybody, good evening. We're gonna get started. Good evening, good evening. Uh, a very, very warm welcome on a very, very cold night. Thank you all for coming out. We have a fabulous panel tonight to talk about cyber law and human rights, particularly in the global south. Uh, I am Rob Farris. I'm the research director at the Berkman Klein Center, and I have the honor of moderating tonight. But the true maestro, maestra of tonight is Jessica Deer. I'm going to have Jessica kick things off and bring the panel up, and then we'll jump in from there. Oh, oh we are being webcast, so be careful what you say. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. So um, as Rob said, and as many of you know, um, I'm Jessica Deer, and I'm the founder of uh, and executive director of SMEX, which is a Beirut-based digital rights organization um, that conducts research, training, and advocacy um, to advance digital rights in the Middle East and North Africa. And this year, I'm a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center um, doing research, uh, which I'll introduce in a second, and um, as the incubating director of something called the Cyrilla Collaborative, which um, you can kind of see a, a web shot. It's the website here. So the Cyrilla Collaborative is a group of six organizations from all over the world who are researching and advocating for human rights, particularly in what we call digitally networked spaces. Um, we've been meeting over the past two days here at the law school, um, and to initiate our collaborative, we're sort of at the beginning of it, and um, a database of what we're calling, for the moment anyway, uh, digital rights law, global digital rights law. And this is um, the database right now. Uh, you can find it at cyrilla.org, C-Y-R-I-L-L-A.org. So why do we need a, data, a global database of digital rights law? In recent years, um, contrary to John Perry Barlow's vision of an independent cyberspace where governments have no sovereignty, national level legislation as well as um, national and regional level jurisprudence uh, have been proliferating worldwide. Um, in developed and developing countries alike, creating new legal frameworks and legal challenges for our sort of ever-evolving digital sphere. And it's happening really fast. So fast, in fact, that it can be difficult, even in the most developed legal environments, to get a grasp on the impacts, trends, and consequences. Sometimes we might see the results as positive, as many have done with Germany's GDPR and earlier with Brazil's Marco Civil. Often, however, the, this proliferation of law can feel reactionary and be associated with negative effects in the closing of civic space. Anti-cybercrime laws, for example, can criminalize online speech and limit the use of encryption, thereby jeopardizing rights of free expression and privacy. So-called fake news laws um, often target independent journalism while, while ignoring that much fake and false news begins as state-led or supported propaganda or information warfare. Those are just a couple of examples. I'm sure you'll hear a lot more tonight. So one of the problems is there's no easy way to track and monitor the evolution of legal frameworks for digital rights in the digital sphere, at least not yet. There's no way to recognize the trends. Yet recognizing the trends before they become bad law is of critical importance for both human rights defenders and policymakers. So the organizations represented and I'll ask you all to go ahead and come up and take a seat, if you would please, are the Association for Progressive Communications. Um, and Rob, I don't know if you're gonna introduce the individuals or if I should. Why don't you do it? Okay, do so it. sure, Gayatri Kandadai from the Association of Progressive Communications is here with us. Um, Robert Muturi from Strathmore University in Kenya's Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology. Holly Johnson from Columbia University's Global Freedom of Expression Case Law Database. And uh, Juan Carlos Lara from Derechos Digitales, which is a digital rights organization in Chile that works in Latin, across Latin America. And then I will also join the panel representing SMEX. <laughs> Um, but we're all working to document, organize, exchange, and extend legislation, law, evolving legal frameworks for digital rights in their respective regions as a way to make these patterns more observable. And our vision is to help social science researchers, uh, human rights defenders, independent journalists, and policy advisors 
some of the user personas that we developed today. Um, gain easier access to relevant law and case law without costly subscriptions and with an issue uh, and legal taxonomy that's eminently relevant to them as well as interoperable with others and other data sets. So currently you can see the prototype at Cirilla.org, which, which right now contains more than 600, is it 600 or, yeah, about 600 um, laws and their translations, uh, judgments and draft laws from countries in the, uh, in the 22 countries of the Arab League. Um, and the vision is to expand this data set um, to have a global scope and to add sort of internal connections and references as well as to do some visualizations of those patterns and trends um, as we further develop the platform um, both within all the regions that we've mentioned, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and Asia, um, and sort of make this a real global resource. So I just want to thank all of you for coming. I'm really grateful to you for being here on the cold night. As Rob said, I really want to thank all of our panelists for their participation. I also want to thank uh, the law school for um, giving us a space to have our partner meeting um, over the last two days and also tomorrow. And the Berkman Klein Center um, and Rob for moderating. So um, thanks very much. And I'm sure we're about to have a really lively an informative discussion. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Here, I'm going to need this. Jess is switching hats now. So yes. uh, <laughs> we have an amazing panel here tonight. I guess what we want to do is we want to hear from the panel, the experts we have assembled, and we also want to have a conversation with all of you all. Um, there's a huge amount of material that we could potentially cover, but let's see where it takes remaining nimble along the way. Um, what I'd love to do, if you wouldn't mind, esteemed panelists, is I'd love to hear from you within a few minutes on like kind of where we are, what are the trains you're seeing, and how do we feel about it? And going with the random order of how you sat down, would you mind kicking us off, Holly? Sure. I, I I think I'll start with um, just sort of a bit of background about our project and what we're working on currently. So the name of our project is the Columbia Freedom of Expression uh, Database, Case Law Database. It was started about five years ago by President Bollinger, President of Columbia University. He's a First Amendment scholar, but he really felt that there was uh, an area that he would like to focus in a university on, which is sort of global problems. Freedom of expression is clearly um, a, a massive issue right now, and with his mandate, we established a, a database and we are now, after five years, we've got almost 1,300 analyses of significant court cases from around the world, of like 130 countries. And we began to build by get, building a team of researchers, about 20 or so legal researchers from all different countries with different language and area expertise. We've tried first to get a baseline of standards from as many countries as we could, and then to try to see if and how national courts are starting to align with international standards. That's really been sort of one of our main areas of focus. And then to also see what sort of trends we're seeing. And I think in the, the digital rights area, a lot of the traditional problems of sort of defamation, for instance, or for, that used to be with the traditional media are now, they've taken on a whole new set of problems in the digital sphere. And, uh, we're also seeing right now a lot of countries that are using national security as an excuse to do internet shutdowns, to take down content block sites, and to that end, we've gotten involved with a new organization, a new initiative in the, in the last year or so. It's called Internet and Jurisdiction Network, and they're based out of France. They're bringing together, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative, so it's tech companies, it's academia, it's civil society, um, human rights organizations, to look at this problem of online content, you know, harmful content, and how do you deal with interjurisdictional takedowns? And um, we're seeing sort of a lot of new case law coming to us and that we're starting to analyze and get a handle on. Um, but it's a 
it's a fascinating and complicated situation, and I have some wonderful regional experts here that can kind of talk to what's happening in, in their areas. I can talk a little bit more later on about sort of what's happening maybe in Europe and in America and can kind of get a balanced view of how different jurisdictions are addressing these challenges. So I'll maybe hand that over to my Thank colleague. Thank you, Robert, please. Thank you very much. Um, so our project is very simple in that it, it's two-pronged. We're doing this out of Strathmore Law School. Um, I'm, I'm part of a think tank um, called the Center for IP and IT, which is SIPIT. You can see Jackie there, our colleague, and also Paranta. Um, maybe they love this winter more, um, but they're colleagues at Strath uh, Strathmore Law School. So basically, um, at the beginning, it was about um, governments, African governments, kind of grappling with how to deal with uh, the emergence of ICTs and there not being enough data. And so um, my predecessor, Moses Karanja, who's actually doing his PhD right now at um, um, Toronto, they conceptualized this idea that let's have a database where we can have um, sort of like a resource portal where um, governments can be able to go and understand all the legislation and other resources that they may be used, uh, they can be able to use to um, create policies. You will notice that even in Kenya, a country that is thought to have adopted ICTs to quite a large extent still doesn't have a national ICT policy. We still just have drafts coming after drafts after drafts. So um, one of the things is to resource governments and um, people that advise policymakers on the right resources that they can use. So we, are, we created this pro policy, it's called the Africa Tech Policy Database, to do that. Then the other part of the project, which is also independent on its own, is that there's few opportunities for, um, for citizens to engage with government in, the, in that process of uh, policy making. So we created a tool called Jadili. Jadili is a Swahili word, which actually means let's, let's discuss the same way we're doing it here, but can we be able to leverage um, online tools to do that? So we have an annotation tool which you can use to comment on bills, and we get the bill from parliament or from what, whoever is sponsoring the bill, then we'll upload it, and from there people can be able to annotate different sections of the law depending on what they are, what their reactions are. But the trend is that we've seen that we still need to mediate um, uh, the, the complexities of legal language, so someone might know what the issue is, they might understand that their privacy might be infringed by a certain provision, but they might not be able to locate the article, they might not be able to understand the language on the article, so there's still more work to be done to be able to help them to um, get their message across. And then we usually take these comments, we um, write a memorandum to parliament, and uh, then they're able the committee that will be considering the issue, because we're specializing with the ICT committee in parliament, they're able to take this and it's part of the handset, part of the discussions that go on to inform their work. Yeah, fabulous, yeah. thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I definitely want to come back to the annotation tool at some point, but sure. uh, please. Thank you. I, can't, I mean, uh, there were a lot of questions. I mean, it, it, what you asked me to do in the next few minutes is, is quite loaded. So I'm going to try and break it up and just talk about the context and uh, the larger context before we go into specific kinds of violations. Uh, if you'd recall, uh, the, at the last Internet Governance Forum, which is essentially a place, a gathering, a process for multi-stakeholder um, groupings to kind of get together and talk about how the internet should be governed, right? And we had the French president, uh, president at the last, um, the last meeting calling for greater participation and a greater role of government in the regulation of the internet. Well, essentially where that came from is to try and find that middle ground between a San Francisco approach of anything goes to a China approach of only what I say goes. Sort of to try and find that middle ground was, was the basis on which the, the, a call for greater participation of government in the regulation of the internet came forward. And this is not just something that's coming from Europe. Um, recently in Davos, you heard the J Japanese um, premier also calling for a greater role of government in the regulation of the internet. And all of this kind of reminds me of what the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression recently remarked by saying regulation is coming. That's just what it is. And that's, just, that's not just for private sector, that's also for how 
users and individuals experience and, and exercise their rights and existence on the internet. And one of the reasons, the, the fundamental reason why we decided to narrow down and not just look at, it, at violation of rights on the internet space, but rather look at laws in the internet space, is because what we are clearly seeing across Asia, and I suspect Africa and elsewhere, is that states are having this knee-jerk reaction to any new phenomena there, what they're calling as new phenomena on the internet. No, it's just, it's just technique, it's, it's essentially just a different way of experiencing violations. So there is legislation seems to be the go-to solution for every problem that we are experiencing with uh, people's ex ex exercise and and uh, also not just exercise their, their expression of their opinions on the online in the online spaces. So in India, for instance, you see laws being given a solution to every sort of problem, whether it's hate speech or disinformation or misinformation, fake news, whatever it is. There's repeatedly laws are being passed off as as sort of the solution. And what we clearly now notice is that. Throughout Asia, we're going through a norm-setting phase for the internet. And that's not just for Asia, across the world. And the reason why it's important for us to get involved in this, in this phase right now is because what states essentially are doing is they are legalizing illegitimate restrictions. And that's not just that. They're actually legitimizing illegal restrictions. Um, this is why we did a research on six countries in Asia with the help of SMEX, uh, from whom we borrowed the methodology. And if you could just bring up that research, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I'd like to go into what the findings of this research were, some, of the, some really interesting findings in the research, but this particular, if you could just go to the front page. So this research looks at six countries in Asia, trying to look at not only ICT-specific laws, because what, what's really happening is that the way our rights are being mediated in online spaces is not just coming from online specific laws, it's coming from your traditional penal code and your constitution and other laws, even broadcasting, telegram laws, all of this also feeds into how our rights are being mediated in online spaces. And I just wanted to add a, a last remark for this round and then we can go back into the kinds of expression the kinds of rights that are being mediated online through these laws. Um, oftentimes we talk about freedom of expression and privacy as the primary rights that get affected or enhanced in online spaces. But actually if you look at it, there are a whole host of other rights that are impacted by the online spaces, but more importantly by laws seeking to govern online spaces. Freedom of assembly and association is one such group of rights. Now increasingly people use online spaces to protest and to form associations which was not possible through traditional means. And these laws are not just impacting how they express, but impacting their very ability to associate and, and also assemble in online spaces. Another way key set of rights that are getting affected by these laws is the right to religion and, and your freedom of uh, religion or belief. You see increasingly states trying to introduce blasphemy provisions within the ICT laws, which is diametrically opposite to what the international community has been calling for, which is the decriminalization of blasphemy. And of course there are culture related rights, gender related rights, all of which are being mediated by these laws. Okay, in the case of Latin America, many of the things that uh, Gaia mentioned about Asia are also applicable. And, and our project, uh, has to do a lot with what's going on in, in a region where we see the tension between the idea of this internet as a space for liberty in a Silicon Valley perspective and that of an internet where government is the one dictating what can go as, as China was used as an example by Gaia just now. And, and that tension is usually resolved or tried to be resolved through law. However, legislation is often not uh, something to be considered in the abstract, but something that is also a product of their context. And I think many examples can be said about that, and I think we can go into those, those restrictions and those uh, effects on, on fundamental rights uh, a bit further down the conversation. Uh, but in the case of the things that we are going to try to do through the project, um, we want to identify those trends as they are happening. The project that we are bringing into the Cyrilla uh, work plan is called Red Latam, and it was initially a, a platform where you could see what the current state of each country in Latin America was back when the project was launched five years ago. And it was mostly an, a 
very uh, superficial analysis of what each country in the region had done in terms of policy and legislation with regards to digital or telecommunications related issues. However, back then, things were much different, and the things that we saw that could be happening were not necessarily something that could be just gathered in that platform uh, in a static form. For instance, uh, we saw that w the things that were happening weekly were much more than we thought possible, and our weekly newsletter uh, gives some of that context each week. At the same time, we yearly uh, produce a report called Latin America in a Glimpse, where we see the trends that uh, each year presents in the region. But as we saw it, uh, our possibility and our capacity to be able to influence processes, either in, our, in Chile, where our main offices are, or in other countries where many other activists are scattered throughout Latin America, uh, many more things could be done if information was updated and it was enough uh, to be part of those processes. So uh, some of the things that we are seeing then and that require a high degree of reaction, of timely reaction by civil society and by other interested stakeholders in the process, uh, like, like academia, like technical experts, like people who are part of the political process uh, and part of democracy, can intervene when that information is available. Those trends in, in Latin America in most recent times have to do with mainly three things, although the digital law space is much larger than that. One has to do with uh, the post-GDPR world, where many countries in Latin America are starting to enact their own data protection laws, such just as it's being discussed here in the US, but in many countries in Latin America, that GDPR influence has become a point where governments have decided to take action to protect personal data, especially from abuses by the states and by companies. However, whether that is the, 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 the solution that it promises to be is something that remains to be seen. And at the same time, we still see that there's some pushback by some uh, data operators that oppose that kind of regulation. Secondly, uh, and as a flip side to that, uh, governments in Latin America have abused their capacity to build databases and to conduct surveillance on their citizens for a long time, and that has continued. As a matter of fact, uh, some, uh, some uh, laws have been used to surveil because uh, the procedural safeguards are just not there to prevent some abuses by the state. And as we have seen, it's not only that they are tapping into phones, but that they are sending um, phishing links for journalists and human rights defenders, and even people who are, like in the case of Mexico, uh, um, activists for health and, and, against, uh, and, and against the pressures of the big companies that use highly sugary, sugary drinks. Uh, in order to also affect them and to affect journalists and to infect their devices and, and surveil them. And, and because uh, in many cases we don't have the restrictions that other countries have or do, we do not have the procedural safeguards to prevent those abuses, they are still being carried out by states. And finally, something that is very relevant to the global political context um, freedom of expression is under constant attack in the region, and in many cases, legislation that is meant to serve against hate speech, or in the case of Honduras, in, uh, to promote cybersecurity or promote uh, healthy uh, conversations online, is uh, legislation that is actually being used to uh, affect freedom of expression, to censor and to uh, prosecute and persecute people who might... Uh, have things to say about their governments. So these acts of censorship that have uh, happened in the region throughout time, they are taking new forms, new shapes, and legislation has been a tool that is, that is being used to this day to uh, help governments in those efforts. So I'll put my hat on now as executive director of SMEX, which is, a, a, as we said, an Arab organization. And the way that we came to sort of Cirilla and, and this project in general 
is uh, post-Arab Spring. Um, it seems like such a long time ago now, but it was really after the Arab Spring when governments in the region sort of got wise to what actually could take place in the online space, and you started to see a lot more um, detentions and uh, other kinds of interrogations and, and prosecutions of activists in the Arab region under a whole host of laws, uh, as Guy was mentioning, Press and publications laws were being used, even drugs laws were being used. Um, and, and so a lot of us in, in, in the sphere sort of started asking ourselves, well, well, what is the legal framework here? Not really realizing, I guess, the, the, the deep problems um, that we were going to find. And so the project kind of started as mapping what the legal frameworks were in about six different countries in the Arab region and sort of looking at, at, at what, what was there and also what wasn't there. Um, in many of the Arab uh, legislation definitions are very vague, they're very arbitrarily applied. Um, and what we also found by doing this research and sort of starting to catalog is we started to see sort of a a proliferation or an uptick in the passage of things like anti-cyber crime laws. Um, and also with the uh, um, ISIS and, and the sort of terrorist, anti-terrorism agenda, we started seeing anti, more anti-terror laws. And we started seeing that they would be passed uh, sort of, you know, in one state and then another state, that they would be have very similar provisions, very similar text. And so we started, again, sort of wanting to see the larger picture. Um, one of the questions I remember that was sort of one of the originating questions of the database is sort of like, it, has it gotten worse since 2011, since the Arab Spring? And I think now we can pretty definitively say, especially in places like Egypt, yes, it has gotten much worse and, and other countries as well. But what we're also starting to see is a lot more sort of sophistication um, and, and really a lack uh, in t of any kind of um, hesitation um, in many of these countries to, to really produce uh, pretty draconian legislation that does govern the internet, especially in places like Egypt um, and in the Gulf states uh, where what you'll end up seeing, and I know this, this uh, you'll end up seeing that punishments for things that happen in online spaces is actually much greater, far greater, both financially and also in terms of imprisonment than it might be for the same kind of act that happens in a public space or in some other kind of offline forum. Um, we've also seen lots of data localization provisions and it's interesting particularly because uh, in the Arab region there's really a lack of, of data protection laws. Um, I think maybe there's four or five, or maybe across the region that are not, and then most of those aren't very well either articulated or enforced. Um, and there's very few access to information laws as well. So we start looking at sort of the whole ecosystem, the whole legal framework of what's available, and um, and we started, you know, developing a methodology after sort of doing this kind of inductive process of just sort of seeing what's there. We decided to go back and learning about others, Red Latam, which was an inspiration to us. So we sort of started saying, hey, we, you know, we should do this for our region. But then we also started discovering other organizations in other regions who were engaged in the same exercise. What are the legal frameworks for human rights in digitally networked spaces? And how, um, and how, how can we um, observe them in a way that's useful for us as advocates or legal reformers or human rights defenders? Um, and so I think a lot of what the initiative has evolved into now is um, sort of, a, it, it's a collaborative sort of approach um, because the, the, the problem is so large and the challenge that we've sort of set ourselves is so large that no one organization can actually take it on alone. So we're trying to standardize things like research methodologies, how do you find these laws, um, issue taxonomies, how do you categorize them so that we have a shared taxonomy so that we can actually know that we're all looking for the same thing and be able to do better comparative analysis both between countries and from a country perspective to a regional perspective as well as maybe between regions and, and, and globally and sort of see, okay, if the general trend is moving in this direction, where does my country or where does my legal system sort of uh, position itself 
according to that. Great, great. Thank you all. I hope you're all thinking of uh, questions for our experts here. So I, I'm super impressed with the ambition of what you're trying to take <laughs> on, and I'm also really overwhelmed and daunted by the enormity of the task. There's so much to look at and to understand. Uh, if you were to look at the research from your various organizations and from others, the publications of the um, Special Rapporteur at the UN for Freedom of Expression, for example, there is a long, long list of things that give us great pause and concern and heartburn. What, what are the things that stand out? So are, are there mistakes being made amongst governments who are trying to catch up and apply law to cyberspace that are worse than the others? Or is it just kind of a big gumbo of, wow, we wish you weren't doing it that way? What, what are the things that stand out? What, are there any particular topics? Is it terrorism? Is it privacy? Is it harassment? Is it hate speech, fake news? Are there things that are being dealt with more awkwardly than others? Or is this just a big morass and we should... What do, what do we do with this? Where, help me make sense of this. Okay, sure. Um, I think I think sort of a starting space for the whole thing is is the broad conclusion that at least in, from the research we've had so far uh, is that there's absolutely no application of a rights-based approach to these laws. So that's def that's quite definitive because forget international standards; these laws are not even meeting national standards that have been established through jurisprudence that's come out over years. Um, so it's not even meeting the constitutional standards. So that's definitely one thing that, that stands out. I think so what- Cyber, no cyber, is just the, they're not following- They're not even, yeah. Or yeah, so. exactly. And the other, I think the other major issue is the copying of laws from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, when we started this research, the hope was to find good practices in different jurisdictions so that lawyers and activists could use them to cite them in, in strategic litigation or other, other such instances. But what we really found was a race of bad practices and, and just bad provisions being replicated in, in different spaces, right? Um, perhaps I could give you one example is, if you could go to page 28 or 29, we tried to do sort of uh, a cross analysis of how certain words are defined in different laws in these countries. Is that the one? Can you go up a bit? Is that the one that says definitions at the top? This is 27. Oh, 27. Well, that's one example. What the table you're seeing up here is what Jessica was talking about, how online offenses are now somehow graver than offline offenses. What would have fetched you one year in prison is now fetching you five years in prison. For what you should have paid $200 is fine, you're paying $2,000 is fine. So these sort of things you can see here, but the next table, which is in, I think two pages later, you see sort of a, a cross a country analysis of what the word definition, sorry, defamation means in these new laws. But the thing is, it, it law look pretty much the same, but that's not the problem. How the word definition, defamation is being interpreted and applied in online spaces that's what's problematic between the different jurisdictions. So that's definitely one. The other issue is, is all of these laws are being actually enacted from the point of view of political order and public order, which could also include terrorism. It could include so many different things. Because one of the things we found in our research is that a form of expression that's clearly targeted is political expression. So any sort of criticism, not only of state uh, policies, but state leaders or like public figures is now being treated as, as offense against state and sedition. So that's definitely, a, 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 and you'll see that clearly in India, criticizing the prime minister is an offense. Criticizing a chief minister is an offense. Singing a song about the chief minister is an offense. Yesterday, someone got picked up for writing a song about Modi. And that's, the, that's sort of the, the reality in which we exist. Yeah, I would add a bit to that, uh, agreeing completely with what Gaia says, because in the Latin American region, the same thing applies. Although we have a very strong inter-American human rights system, which all Latin American countries are subject to, although Cuba and Venezuela are somewhat away from it, um, 
the standards are out there. However, they are not necessarily considered for legislation. And that's a general thing. It doesn't have to be with cyber or no cyber. But the problem uh, that adds up with uh, digital uh, and cyber law has to do with, uh, first, uh, a lack of understanding of uh, the digital spaces and its different implications, and the rush to regulate things even when uh, experts and academia do not agree on, on the consequences, even when the consequences by those laws can be quite grave. And secondly, apart from that lack of, of knowledge and lack of consultation with experts or with civil society or, or different stakeholders, has to do with uh, the intention to rush with a political purpose, as Gaia was saying, to react to phenomena that, uh, that appear as fashionable. Many uh, draft bills on fake news were presented throughout the Latin American region in the last few years. Uh, several of them mention the term disinformation or fake news, but are actually about silencing voices. And in many cases, they are just using uh, available legislation uh, to, to take measures against some people. Uh, throughout history, that's happened not only by national legislation, it was famous a case by the Ecuadorian government censoring through DMCA in the US jurisdiction, um, a, a content from YouTube, uh, but other forms of censorship are appearing, other forms of legally allowed censorship are appearing because uh, they understand that to hold on to uh, themes or ideas or concepts that, that might be trendy, such as fake news or hate speech, and to use those to quickly pass laws that allow for censorship, as it happens in Venezuela, uh, is, is, is a useful tool uh, for them to just enact troublesome laws. I could say maybe a few words about what's taking, uh, you know, what's taking place in Turkey. That's something that we've been monitoring a lot. There you have a country that for a while seemed to be on a semi-democratic path but has taken a, a terrible turn in recent years with, with Erdogan and then the coup that took place. And at that point there was a massive turning point and actually some of the changes um, started years before where they started to shift uh, the judiciary, remove a lot of judges that came from a more sort of secular background and started to put in more politicized judges and that's really led to extraordinary abuses um, of the judicial power to crack down on independent media, academics, um, online speech profoundly uh, in the name of national security, you know, claiming that uh, there's a lot of content online that is being posted by their political enemies. They have just wholesale blocked YouTube and Wikipedia, and there's an enormous amount of court cases that are now moving from Turkey to the Inter the uh, European Court on Human Rights. There was a recent constitutional crisis in Turkey where there, the constitutional court had ordered the release of journalists that had been, according to them, wrongly imprisoned based upon European standards. The lower courts absolutely refused to abide by the constitutional court, which was sort of a first. That's really what they're supposed to be doing. So it came a, a bit of a showdown. And so now the European Court of Human Rights is being completely overwhelmed by literally tens of thousands of cases that they have to now hear and they're putting them to um, emergency measures and the Europeans are now trying to use these institutions that were built many years ago to prevent these sorts of you know, like democracy is sort of unraveling in Turkey and you know, can these institutions actually right Turkey and kind of get it back on course? Or you know, what direction is, is this ultimately gonna go in? And, and that's an extreme case, but you start to see that in other countries that um, you know, even Hungary potentially, it's, it's more subtle, but those are definitely trends that are emerging. I, 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 can I just, I'll just add, I'll add a really short comment, which is um, recently I was involved uh, with many other groups uh, in sort of drafting um, responses to the anti-terrorism directive that's been proposed um, recently. And one of the most troubling uh, parts of it is that it's actually encouraging um, the com Silicon Valley companies that we're talking about uh, to implement algorithmic and sort of black box like um, 
content moderation in ways that the policymakers just really a don't understand. I think we've all, you know, most people in this room understand that there is no understanding exactly how that would work. And um, and but yet there's such there feels to be such a push to to make this happen, despite the fact that there are so many civil society and expert technical expert voices out there saying it shouldn't happen because of these sorts of agendas of you know the anti-terrorist agenda. And quite frankly, one of the things that I'm concerned about, I have I'm I'm it's always on my mind is as we start to see more. Um, I start to see like what what's happening as you know in the same way that that in the early days of the internet and social media we felt that you know there was this asymmetrical advantage for the people versus the governments that didn't know how to use these technologies what we're now seeing is that there's an asymmetrical advantage for less uh, from from governments with less developed legal systems and frameworks to be able to impose their sort of policy decisions and norms onto a, a, a what we want to be a more democratic global order. So you start to see sort of the policies of very repressive states like in the Middle East, like in the UAE, repressive but rich states, sort of somehow flowing back into more democratic processes. And I, I have not had the time to really trace that in a way that, I, that would be 100% satisfying to me. But I woke up this morning reading about, um, for, on Reuters, about a surveillance operation that had been taken place, uh, that had been in, in, in the Emirates, um, where, what was it? It was, it was basically X, um, uh, X, was it X? U.S. intelligence people, yes, going to work for the UAE to spy on people. And, you, and so there's these insane kinds of parallel things happening. Um, and Khashoggi, just since you mentioned Turkey, and, and I know what um, your executive director is doing now is sort of doing the investigation of Khashoggi's murder, where, you know, what is the dominant policy uh, force in the world is not necessarily as given as it once was. So I, I want to ask, it's probably a very difficult question, but um, is there a way to separate out kind of the opportunities and challenges of the digital space from the rest of things? I mean, in some ways it's harder perhaps, or sometimes it's easier to make better laws and promote good governance, or is it just harder across the board? So there is example, so Turkey, it, there's general democratic and governance backsliding across the board. Turkey's not alone. Some of us, we live in places where that occurs in other realms as well. Um, is, what are the particular challenges and opportunities of lawmaking in the digital realm? Uh, that is a very loaded and complex question, uh, but but it, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I can ask those questions. <laughs> oh yeah, and I am a lawyer, and I can give you an answer that says nothing in a lot of words. Yeah. Uh, but f from what we have seen in in my, in, in our experience at Derechos Digitales, and, and I think it's a common thing for many of the organizations that are part of our formal and informal networks. Uh, many of the things that we are seeing are not necessarily something that have to, has to do with technology. Of course, technology needs some degree of, of especially constructed rules and norms. Yes, it does. However, we cannot escape the context within which that regulation appears, whether it's regulation by states or by international norms or by self-regulation even. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that um, the prevalence of digitally networked spaces is so ingrained in our lives, it, it's something so part of it that all of the social problems that we see are manifested through technology. Technology is not necessarily the cause rather than, than the symptom for many of societal problems. In the case of Latin America, we see that mostly uh, in the forms of the challenges to democracy that appear with, with what we see as uh, effects on freedom of expression or freedom of assembly or even uh, access to the internet. Those are in the end manifestations of the problems that we have also for economic inclusion when we see that um, 
policies to connect people are not there, or in the case of one specific country where policies uh, are basically to omit taking action towards uh, maintaining telecommunications infrastructure. And that has political ramification, and that has ramifications for the exercise of economic, social, cultural rights, apart from civil and political rights. So uh, it is a very complex question, because what we see in online spaces is basically a reflection of what happens for all of society. Uh, but in terms, even though that seems like a daunting challenge, it is still an opportunity for those of us working in, in the digital realm and in digital regulation uh, because uh, we have still the opportunity to uh, switch course and to hopefully, uh, when we try to influence policy processes to reflect human rights and human rights values and principles, uh, to also manifest that society in general and the manifestation of, of the democratic uh, will through law uh, can go in a different direction that has gone this far. Just, just before we address that, but it's a very interesting question, but before we address that, I just wanted to add to your previous question of what is the basis on which these states are enacting beyond and besides uh, terrorism and national security, the newest like genre of ex excuses and explanations for regulating rights online has been development and efficiency. Now states are now like, I've had to give you a classic example. It's the case of Aadhaar in India, which is the biometric ID system. And the reasoning for a really poor idea was to make the, f the functioning of the state more efficient and f to make sure that development, without answering the question of development for whom or how, uh, that welfare schemes are better implemented. And that's also the basis for which we have the social media credit system in China is to, is to sell this, selling this idea of regulating you so that you will be better off. That's, that's sort of, you know, that's one thing. But in terms of challenges, I think the case of Bangladesh is, is sort of on point in, in this relation because Bangladesh has a ICT tribunal presided by judges who don't understand ICTs. And the cases that they are dealing with are so complex, but then they're so apparently just politically motivated. So you see the challenge there being that you've created an institution, but you've really not created a backbone for that institution or really a basis for that institution to function. So that's one significant challenge. The second significant challenge is that <clears throat> when you try to regulate the internet, the internet is going to be used against you as well. So you see mass movements happening online and offline as pushbacks against internet regulation. Uh, if I had to give you two classic examples, is the net neutrality law that they tried to introduce in India. There was such a huge pushback that they had to roll it back in less than, I think, a month. And last year, they introduced a, they actually put out a public tender called, the state called for tech, techno, technologists to develop a 360 degree surveillance tool that not only looks at your social media activities, but also tries to listen into your emails to, to get a sense of public sentiment on, on, on state policies. There was such a huge pushback against that they had to like, they had to apologize to the public. I think there have been really important movements like that, which is also positive in the sense that people are pushing back. And in the case of Pakistan, the, Paki uh, the Pakistan Electronic Crimes Bill in its original form was truly bad. In its current form as an act, is still bad, but not as, as bad as before, because civil society was able to rally behind it and, and, and bring about significant changes. So I think the internet itself is actually a great opportunity to push back against internet legislation. I think I can say um, that there's, apart, apart from, uh, let's say, development-oriented um, ways of controlling um, the legislative process, there's also, national security interests, which we always have to balance with um, digital rights. And so, like in my country, you'll see that every time, we, we unfortunately, having terrorist attacks, you end up with more um, extreme um, security measures, security laws, that then end up infringing rights and then end up being uh, challenged in court and suspended. And, and it, I feel like it's an expensive iteration that is unnecessary. And um, there's the appropriation of the legislative process. And when you find that, you know, the Constitutional Court has declared um, 
that you can't criminalize libel, and then you still end up doing it again and then again. There's a problem. So um, actually, one of the projects I'm about to close a, a deal on is to study how to balance national um, security clauses vis-a-vis -vis digital rights. But then you have to ask yourself, what are digital rights? And, and I, you know, usually people will challenge the question of, is there anything like digital rights? And I find the question you know, redundant, because it's the same thing. 10 years ago, we were asking, is there anything like technology law? Right now, we're asking. I was teaching social media law, trust me. And guys, my, my students were like, is there anything like that? I'm like, let's, let's bother ourselves with finding the distinguishing characteristics that are actually unique online than bothering whether or not this is a form of law or not, because now it's settled. Tech law is being taught all over the world as a master's program, as a bachelor. It's established. So we have to immediately start thinking, what does the digital right of access look like? Because then we can start seeing how to safeguard it against um, misappropriation when it comes to the legislative process. And we can start then writing you know, serious academic papers that can inform that kind of kind of process. Um, yeah, so I think there's many forms of information control. I'm, I'm, a, I'm finishing up a report on a Ford uh, project that we've had since 2016 that was studying um, internet shutdowns in the Kenyan elections and the Zimbabwe elections. So we were looking to see whether the sh internet would be shut down. In Kenya, it wasn't shut down. Zimbabwe eventually was shut down. Um, and not even shut down, someone defaced it. So it wasn't even the government that people were looking to shut down the, the internet that actually did it. The thing is, there's many people that can control the internet. So I had to expand the scope of my research to look at information controls, not just technical, but other forms. So in Africa, there's a trend to use either taxation laws or other forms of law, um, registration procedures. So in, for instance, in Tanzania now, bloggers have to register with um, some organization, they have to pay $480 for a three-year license, they have to pay some, I think, $400. And um, every year uh, in Uganda, you have to pay, I think it's five cents per day to browse the internet, which is about like 15% above um, the, what do you call it, the living wage or something. Um, so there's many other forms of control that you can come to exert on, on the internet. And we have to start understanding what these are and that will tell us what the challenges really are in, in legislative processes. But also these, I mean, judiciary, judiciaries are rising up to the occasion. So like in Kenya now, we really trust our judiciary to uh, rise up to the occasion and just say no. And we have the Cyber Crimes Act, 26 sections of the Cyber Crimes Act passed last year have been suspended. And um, Zimbabwe also, um, the, the, the Constitutional Court um, ref, um, reversed the decision by the minister to shut down the internet uh, recently when they had a protest over, I think it was fuel, fuel um, prices. So um, there's many ways that al also people are, are tackling the challenges. That's, that's great. I, I appreciate it. Thank you all for adding good experiences to this as well. And one of the things that I'm pondering uh, as we move forward is like how can we switch the norm from copying perhaps bad experiences and bad laws to good laws and the experience of the people pushing back and restraint by governments as well. Um, help us push the conversation forward. Who, who has a question, an observation, <laughs> preferably a question? Or Scasser, please, thank you. Thank you so much for a really impressive and somewhat depressing uh, <laughs> uh, opening of, of this conversation. Uh, let me frame the question a little bit. I'm, I'm worried as a, as, a, as a lawyer, as a law professor, um, about the reputation of law generally, um, not only in the context of tonight's conversation. And it, it seems a paradox because um, uh, on the one hand side, here in the US in particular, especially for a European living here, um, there's been a dominant some sort of narrative that uh, in our space, in the technology space, like keep the lawyers out and things will be wonderful. We see all this innovation, we will see great transformations um, that are enabled through technology, through entrepreneurship. So that's been some sort of one of the dominant narratives pushed by Silicon Valley uh, proponents. Now on the other hand side, uh, we listen to you. 
uh, and and the, the experiences you document, and somehow arrive at a similar, yet for different reasons, uh, um, a conclusion that oh, law ooh, is creating all sorts of really bad outcomes and problems, and it does right. So I'm I'm wondering how can we deal with that uh, tension, uh, because. Of course, there's also another way to look at law, uh, and, and you made several references already to, to human rights uh, laws, to frameworks um, that protect people, that uh, open up spaces for human flourishing, that safeguard us um, at a particular moment in time where maybe law or this type of law may become more important than ever as we think about the shifts in autonomy away from humans to machines. Um, Dennis has done terrific research over there on, on documenting the emergence of Bill of Rights uh, and some sort of a digital constitutionalism. Again, a, a different version of law that is, is arguably very positive for the world and for well-being and for, for individuals. So my question is, how do we deal with this rhetorical problem and how can we take be mindful that somehow we not end up trashing law for very different reasons, but are more precise or find a new vocabulary um, so that we um, don't end up suggesting for very different reasons, oh, keep the law away. Uh, because one problem that we then face is, well, if we do that, um, who are the actors filling the vacuum and some of the problems, of course, we face today are already the result of, of this vacuum. So, thank you. I'll go first. I'll go first just because I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, I don't have the answer. I think one of the things that, that I'm a non-lawyer that for some reason has gotten myself involved in this incredibly intensely legal project. And um, I have to say, like I, when I first started researching the laws from the Arab region uh, in 2013, 2014, um, it was the first time I'd really ever considered law and reading laws and, and sort of understanding what they are and have over the years sort of developed an understanding of the structure and I was <laughs> in the session today um, being very authoritative on things that I shouldn't probably have been so authoritative about. But, but I only bring that up because I think one of the challenges is that law has become inaccessible in many ways and has been, and especially when we're in this digital sphere where it's, it's all of a sudden it's become so relevant in something that feels like we know you know, the, the lay person or the citizen or the normal person or the ordinary person, however we describe it, you know, we're dealing with all these tools and yet at the same time, there are all these policies that are much more immediate to us now because they're restricting very, very in our interpersonal space or in our impersonal space, what we can and can't do. And so one of, you know, so I think, I think one thing that our project is trying to do is make law more accessible. So making law more accessible um, is, is one of the things that I think uh, needs to be done. Now how that happens, I'm not 100% sure, um, but I think making it more accessible and understandable is one of them. I think also what we've talked about a lot over the past couple of days is the need for better, and I think Berkman attempts to do this, and, I'm, and, and maybe the legal technology sort of programs that you're talking about, Robert, but to, to have, I think you said it, Robert, this, this week, that we need more lawyers who understand technology and more technologists who understand the law and more opportunities for, for them to meet and, and to really understand what the implications of uh, certain policy and codes are on certain codes and policies. Um, I don't know that it, there's no, I, I, in my mind, there's no silver bullet. I certainly, and I've gone through this like, well, is the, as things, you know, the worry, you know, one of the worries I have is as algorithms become more powerful and, and artificial intelligence, and I think others are asking this question, what will the need for law be when everything's just encoded, right? And we don't want to lose that because within law and, 
and within is so much humanity as well. And if and if and if within law is really justice, because can an algorithm be just? I mean, I think we're all sort of asking ourselves that question. Then then there is certainly a need for a law and a law that is is implemented by people and not machines. So I don't want to get rid of it, but. Yeah, um, as a recovering lawyer, uh, what I might add to that is, uh, is that um, what we see in these spaces is that we want some degree of protection. We want protection for, for our interests, not only by, for our interests themselves, but the enabling conditions for those interests, like the idea of having agency to decide what rules govern our spaces and to decide what we do with our information and, and to be safe from abuse. And uh, those efforts from the Towards Digital Constitutionalism paper, brilliant one, recommended for every lawyer who hasn't read it and every non-lawyer as well, has shown is that that effort exists. Uh, but to bridge what lawyers can do and what technologists can do, and the important to, for every technology user or person possibly affected by technology, uh, can have from that space is that the effort to um, bridge the gaps between those in power, those who make the decisions and rules, either states or companies, and the people who are affected are of utmost importance. And I think that's one of the reasons why many of us uh, came into the internet policy space to try to promote rules, not only with regards to government, but also with regards to companies and the rights that through law or through policy people have to defend their rights. And that's why also so many of us have slightly moved from thinking about technology law for the public interest to speaking directly about human rights law. Uh, because we see that those standards, uh, first, they are global. Secondly, uh, they might get usually ignored by people who are thinking about the law or their immediate interests rather than the idea that there are already uh, principles and rules in place to defend those interests. And as such, um, those can be wielded by users. So bridging those gaps and providing the information for people about what is relevant to defend those rights and to defend those interests is that uh, projects like ours appear and why activities of organizations like advocacy organizations like mine and, and others too uh, become so important and that's why we gathered here also as well. I mean, I think, I think the answer to that is, is sort of in trying to understand what the internet has has brought in, right? Uh, the decentralized nature of the internet should have ideally led to decentralization of power and economic power as well, right? But what we are actually seeing is a result of internet has been the centralization of power, but decentralization of labor. If you look at how Google or Facebook really function, they essentially, we are, we are the workers for them. And it's, it's just our data through which they, they monetize our data, right? So all of that is essentially going to lead to regulation. There's no way to escape that. I, and I'm saying this because these platforms are touching on key democratic processes, like elections, like democracy itself. So there's no way that, that, that they are not going to get regulated because the impact of that is serious. It's not just personal harm, but it's political harm in, in sort of a much broader sense. And I don't, I, I'm not sure, I, I, of course I can't speak for the other organizations. I don't think in any way we are advocating for no regulations. Because that's essentially what we are saying. We, we are saying that these, not only platforms, but the way states function and regulate our rights is problematic. But what, what I'm essentially trying to, to convey is that in most cases, offline laws are anyway being used in online spaces penal codes are anyway being extended to online spaces, then do you really need to have specific provisions that are suddenly creating newer categories of, of crimes and, and offenses which did not exist, which have been interpreted in a certain fashion, and as a result of these new laws, you're reinterpreting, reinventing the wheel. So I think the first problem is to try to, to sort of standardize what's being applied in offline to online any, in any case. The second I think significant issue to get past is to look at what are the newer forms of problems that the internet and technology, the use of technology creates. Uh, 
regulating that space is what's important for not only technicians, technologists, and lawyers to talk about, it's important for users to talk about because ultimately it's their rights that are being mediated by states and not only states, by private sector as well. I think in that regard, jurisprudence that's coming from the global south is extremely important. I think for a while now we've been repeatedly looking to, to Europe and America to sort of set the standards on, on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. But if you really look at it, there has been fantastic jurisprudence that's come out from Asia, and there's, of course, extremely problematic jurisprudence that's also come out from the same uh, courts and sometimes the same judges even uh, on issues touching upon technology. I mean, recently the, the, the sorry, Islamabad High Court held that internet shutdowns are, are unconstitutional, something that, that, that well-established courts in India could not not achieve, but of course that's a challenge now and, and we're hoping that the Supreme Court would, would uh, take the same view. And, and if we look at the dissenting opinion that came out in the Aadhaar judgment, which is the biometric ID system, it's a fabulous dissenting opinion. Of course, they up ultimately upheld the constitutionality of the program, but the dissenting opinion really lays out what many of us have still not been able to articulate. So I think the key is to, to keep an eye out for the significant jurisprudence that's coming from that region. And I would just add that after reading a lot of cases over the last few years, I, I have to say a few positive things, particularly coming from Europe. The courts are getting more sophisticated in their understanding of technology. So uh, some of the earlier ones, you could tell it was a very gray area. They would come up with sort of general principles, but they weren't really engaging the specifics of the technology. And so now um, there was a, for, uh, just a for instance, it was a, a right to be forgotten case um, in Spain. And it went through various levels of courts but the conversations that the courts were having about the different rights was on a very, very more technical level uh, than I had ever seen before. So I, I think in a certain sense that's a positive trend. Um, at least the outcome of that particular case was generally more positive than some of the things we've seen. Um, what we're also seeing now is that a lot of the social media platforms are realizing that they are just overwhelmed with requests for content takedown. There has to be some sort of regulation. If they can't go to the courts because they're getting millions of requests you know, daily, weekly. And just in the last couple of weeks, Facebook, in fact, just this week, Facebook has come out with a statement that they are putting forth a proposal to create a council that would be an, a, effectively an appeals council that would be established by a group of international experts. They would fund it, but they're trying to find a way of making sure that they're able to maintain independence for this particular group. And they would be the ones that would be doing the transparent appeals process of all of these different you know, content takedown requests. Article 19, which is a uh, Freedom of Expression Organization based in the UK. They have an alternate model that they're putting forth for online regulation of content. Theirs is more based on the press council approach where it would be industry people getting together. They would be selected or elected into a, a council to review these things. And so that at least brings the whole industry together, whereas Facebook is looking for a council that would be specific to Facebook issues. And there's some you know, back and forth about what is the best model uh, on that. Facebook has said that they feel for time constraints and out of like this pressing need, they need to move forward as quickly as they can to establish this and you know, make the councils as representative internationally as they can, but there's obviously limitations to that. So now there's this tension going on of we have corporations that are uh, involuntarily acting as public squares. They are really profit-making institutions and they've got all of these users who are very concerned about the content that's up there and they now have to take on these regulatory functions that they're not comfortable doing. So they don't want to relinquish all of control but they do need to have some sort of independence. They've got to take the weight off the courts and we'll just have to kind of see how all of this shakes out. <laughs>
Yeah. It was, of course, inevitable and necessary that we get to Facebook at some point. I'm really impressed that we made it as far as we did. <laughs> yeah. It's like, is there, I don't know if there's an equivalent to Godwin's law about when you bring up Facebook anytime yeah. you're talking about the internet. But uh, anyway, we made it pretty far. Uh, other thoughts, questions? Nikki, and then. Um, so first of all, thank you. This is, is a really cool project, and um, I'm looking forward to the final product. Um, I met GNI, and we have a, a, a project called a Country Legal Framework that's basically just websites with a lot of text on them. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. the notion of something searchable and and comparable. Um, so. Um, Juan Carlos, you noted the trendiness around certain issues and how that can prompt um, legislation or, or, or topics, bills um, that come up for um, debate. And, and so I think an example of that might be uh, the EU's draft terrorist content online regulation, um, which happens to coincide with um, upcoming elections in the European Parliament in May. So I think Generally, in like the advocacy space, there's not a lot of optimism that there's going to be many changes to that bill, though it is, um, um, everyone kind of agrees it's pretty problematic. So my question is, um, um, with kind of the increasing politi politicization um, of many topics in the digital space where they maybe once weren't, um, alongside kind of increasing polarity of, um, politicians and politics. Um, do you see that, do you see uh, kind of those having effects on the cyber law that is being created um, or, or um, um, discussions around it? So, okay, question being, um, how is increasing polarity and increasing politicization, politicization of digital rights issues, um, particularly since 2016, the election in the US? perhaps um, them becoming more public in a way that they haven't been before. Um, how is that having an effect on cyber law in your regions, but also kind of in the, the flow of, of legislation from one region to another? Would you want to go in order? Oh. Well, uh, if, because I was mentioned, I will answer first. Uh, um, I think uh, the examples from Latin America are many, uh, not only in law, but also in policy and policy actions. Uh, especially with, I think, Venezuela as an example of so many things that we see as wrong with the world that it's not surprising that they have passed laws against certain forms of speech based on the idea of that, that um, insulting or offending certain public officials should be treated as a, as a special form of, of, uh, of uh, harmful speech. Um, so that opportunity has been taken there, and that was... Uh, a draft bill is still discussed in Honduras, and that has been taken into Congress also in places like Brazil and Chile, uh, even though it might not, it wasn't, it didn't pass in those cases. Uh, but that increasing polarization is being seen in all of those countries. Uh, Nicaragua also uh, shut down a few media outlets and jailed a few people also who were protesting against the government. And those policy actions were also based on what people were saying online. One civil society organization in Ecuador was shut down because of one retweet by their account. Uh, in a particularly oppressive government that is not an authoritarian, totalitarian government, but still is, has shown signs of, uh, of being against freedom of expression. So when we see the influence of political polarization and politicization of the regulation of cyber law is, is yet again an example of uh, governments becoming aware of the impact that they can have by regulating technology, which means that they can thus regulate some especially sensitive forms of uh, social manifestation and social organization. So uh, although examples can be seen all throughout the world, I think that in the case of Latin America, they are also taking advantage of the fact that uh, we are in a post-2016 world where even though we have a longer history of, of, of uh, politicization and coup d'etat here and there and everywhere, uh, that uh, those kinds of regulations and rules and norms that 
have affected social life in the past are being also being adopted into the digital realm. Um, whether that will remain the case or not is something that remains to be seen, but so far uh, advances have, have not been so encouraging. And I would add to that that uh, some laws years ago or decades ago did reflect some rather uh, positive view of the internet and uh, an example was given by Jessica about the Marco Civil, the internet in Brazil, uh, the net neutrality law in Chile, a few laws about uh, repositories for open access uh, literature in Peru, in Argentina, and something in Mexico as well. But those things remain in the past where things were seen from the cyber law perspective. But politicization uh, has indeed been taken as a form of either uh, exerting higher levels of control or uh, in some cases also to either uh, propose support or opposition based on governments that are promoting those laws. So yes, it, it has an effect and it's not a great effect so far, but still the opportunities to influence those processes remain open. So as some of you briefly mentioned, that in some countries, for example, South Korea, um, traditional laws, you know, defamation, uh, criminal defamation provision, uh, provisions and national security laws are used to um, regulate uh, expression and speech online, uh, particularly to silence critics, government critics. And I wonder when, whether any of you have um, can comment on recent trends in this area, in particular, how civic organizations are uh, dealing with uh, related situations? I mean, that's sort of, that's, that's the clear trend, right? Um, I think uh, political expression, along with artistic expression, uh, religious expression, and sexual expression, if I had to think of four broad categories, these are the four broad categories that are particularly targeted in, in, in online spaces. Um, there have been very important movements that civil society has been engaged in to push back. Um, one would be uh, the, the whole um, movement that ultimately led to the, so the Supreme Court striking down a provision in India, 66A of the IT Act, saying it's unconstitutional because it doesn't... Th there were two women who were picked up for saying that the traffic situation as a result of a political leader's death is unacceptable, that's all she said. She was picked up and charged under the, under the IT Act. And there was a big movement behind that that resulted in the Supreme Court saying this is unacceptable. So I think that is, that is an important, uh, that kind of a trend is, is important. But what you clearly are now facing is, is that opposition parties are trying to promise uh, to democratize the internet. Now you take Malaysia as an example. They introduced the anti-fake news law a couple of years ago. And the opposition has now come into power after 60 years, the first time there's been a regime change in Malaysia. They've, they've pretty much repealed the anti-fake news law. So, and that's the same thing in India. You see the opposition promising to democratize spaces. So there is sort of a nexus that's now building between uh, civil society and political opposition that is political opposition today. I'm quite confident the situation will change once the opposition is no more the opposition. But I think another very important um, way in which civil society is trying to grapple with the situation is in terms of how electoral laws are not catching up with the internet. If there is one, one field of law that's really failed to catch up with the internet, it is electoral laws. Uh, because you see how political parties, not only the, their official political parties, but the cyber armies they have in online spaces, how they violate people's rights, why not, not only their ability to express themselves, but their privacy as well. I think that's another very significant way in which civil society is, be, is, is starting to expose some of these organized ways in which the state uh, represses individuals. It's, it's wonderful. I, one of the things that surprises, surprises me about this conversation is how everything that's said seems to apply to the United States today. Um, but I just want to say that it's not 2016. The repression of people didn't start with 2016 because we've had terribly repressive leaders for many years. So I just want to take the credit back uh, because Philippines and India are up there. Right, right. So uh, we just have a couple minutes left. If there's any, I'd like to just collect a couple of remaining questions and then we can wrap things up. 
So my question is for Gayatri. Thank you very much for your stimulating comments. Uh, when we hear of uh, things such as social media companies monetizing our data or serving as uh, facilitators for uh, spread of fake news, our instant reaction is that there should be laws uh, that prevent such issues. But then the manner in which, uh, particularly in India, the government has uh, stepped in with regulation has also created concerns. Uh, you mentioned the Aadhaar case uh, also in December. Uh, the government of India released a five-line uh, executive order stating that any uh, investigation agency has full authority to intercept and monitor and decrypt any information exchanged through a computer device, uh, which actually received pushback from WhatsApp, which uh, refused to introduce a decryption backdoor in its system. So uh, since uh, there are issues about the ability of corporations or the willingness of corporations to regulate themselves, and also concerns about the government uh, exceeding its authority or excessively restricting uh, uh, rights and freedom. Uh, what would you think is a better model for uh, regulating these new technology issues? Self-regulation by the technology industry or proactive legislation by the government? Or is it actually a choice between the devil and the deep blue sea? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a big, big question. If we can answer that one in the next five minutes, we'll have done well. Um, I don't and, think it's really possible to answer that. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions we want to throw in? Ellery? Uh, um, I just... Hey. Um, I, I wondered if you could talk, anybody could talk for a minute about state of emergency. Because so I work at Global Voices. We had this like joke going for a while where so many of our editors were living in countries that were in a state, sort of ongoing state of emergency. And it, it, it led to a lot of silly stuff in, just internally, but it was kind of this, this state of exception or, or whatever it is where <sighs> the law doesn't really matter that much, yeah. or you use it only, the government uses it only the way, exact way that it is useful, and if there isn't a law that it can use, it doesn't matter, because it's a state of emergency. I'm just kind of curious, in the context of this project, how do you think about those kinds of circumstances? Or do you, or are you? That's great. All right, We've got a couple minutes, let's wrap it up. <laughs> Should we go down the row? Yeah. The, if you have thoughts, yeah. we haven't heard as much from Holly and Robert as others. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, what comes to mind for me is is Turkey, and we've been monitoring sort of the complete dismantling of the judiciary there, and so much of that happened during these states of emergencies where they could really do just about anything, and they were rounding up thousands of judges and journalists and academics and throwing them into jail. Another thing that they did is they, it was almost like a vigilante law that they put forth where citizens who could track down and find people who are allegedly coup plotters, they could then take action against them. And there really wasn't much that Europe could do. Now we had the Venice Commission and a lot of statements coming out and people going over and talking to them and kind of wagging the finger, but they were not all that effective. Um, and that was one of the things I think that's been very sort of distressing. There's an enormous amount of hope that the the European institutions, and particularly the European court, would be able to intervene on a level that would kind of rein in Erdogan and what he was up to. And it hasn't worked out all that well. Um, so that's kind of a scary place to, to be. And again, as I said, there's like tens of thousands of court cases now before the European court, and we, we don't know how that's all going to come about. Um, so I'll say, there's not always a nexus. So I was doing, uh, with, with this study on information controls, we were trying to look at the nexus between legal frameworks and um, technical forms of control, controlling the internet. And we didn't always find a, shut, um, a nexus. So a government will just do what they want sometimes and just, yeah. Um, but you have to, we have to go back to, you know, Lawrence Lessig again. these four models for regulating the internet. It's not always the law, it could be the market, the norms, it could be the infrastructure. And, and so we can't ignore his question, which we actually have. <laughs> because um, digital rights are not absolute rights. Sorry, guys. But, um, 
Yeah, we do have to balance them. We have to think in that situation in India where people were being mur murdered um, from this WhatsApp fake news phenomenon, um, we have to tackle directly the, the issue ahead of us. And, and it is, if self-regulation doesn't work and state regulation is extreme, what core regulatory model can we apply? Those are also principles we know from early on um, regulating the internet because um, Western jurisdictions as well, Australia is well on, full on um, headed towards an encryption, um, anti-encryption law, yeah. and it's going to be there. We have to start thinking about what end product do we want? Do we start thinking about balance right now? And what does that look like? Or should we just, you know, all stay stuck to our guns? So, yeah, I, I do have a solution right now, but I do have, as I said, I, I, I have this project that I want to start, um, and, and we have to actually finish it within six months. Um, that will look, we will we'll go to parliament and try to have workshops with parliament and, and judiciary on legislative drafting and to see how to bring in a new, a theory of, of, of um, regulating the internet. Because what I feel is there's a gap uh, in legal theory. I mean, even it was only halfway through my PhD when I realized I have no understanding of legal theory, although I thought I did because I'm a lawyer, but it was shock on me. It's an entirely different practice, and I had to study it for nine months. I actually had to extend my PhD on nine months because I was also studying regulation of emerging technologies. And so I am usually confronted with gaps in the law, and for me that's normal, but it's not... It's maybe not normal in, 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 in other circles. So we have to think about what does a balance look like um, in, that, in that perspective. I'm, I'm glad you addressed that question because I was, I was trying to figure out how to answer that, uh, that question. And I think, I think the answer lies in, in many different things that, that we as individuals would also have to do beyond legal, and, uh, legal frameworks and, and the courts. And the most important thing is decentralizing the internet in a real way. Decentralizing not just monopolies that exist within the internet, but decentralizing the way infrastructure of internet, promoting community networks, commu promoting smaller internet providers. I think that is actually sort of lies at the heart of the problem that we are facing today. And then comes the question of trying to adopt not only uh, open source as, as technology we use, but open source as a philosophy and a political framing. I think that sort of goes back to the heart of how to fight big corporations in that sense. Uh, but this whole thing that Holly and Robert were talking about in terms of self-regulation from the private sector, I guess one other way of looking at it is also to look at the UN principles on business and human rights. And, and I, I'm not convinced that private sector is getting enough pushback Though they, they look like they're getting enough pushback, I don't think they're getting enough pushback. So that, that also comes back to civil society and, and, and individuals in, in how we use private sector um, mass-produced sort of technologies that's shoved in our faces, right? Uh, but when it comes to regulation, I think, I think it, what I'm going to say is going to sound too simplistic. But really the problem is that there's no rights-based approach to ICT laws right now. There's no rights impact assessment either by private sector or by the state when they introduce new provisions or tweak existing provisions to, to apply to the internet. But I think the most important thing is, is adopting things like privacy by default, whether it's by for private sector or for state-sponsored uh, undertakings like Aadhaar or any other uh, major ID system, right? So I think it's also making that a default that matters. But this is going to be evolving. It's just sort of not even the start. So I think it's about us remaining vigilant and, and agreeing on basic principles that approach law and how we get, how we are regulated on the internet. Yeah, uh, I, I want to briefly uh, answer some of the questions posed by the idea of states of emergency, because uh, in the context of this project, one thing that is very important for us is to identify and document cases where state of emergency situations have presented themselves with impacts on the internet, and that has been the case in Venezuela and Nicaragua throughout 2018 as well. But second, I think it's, it's key also to understand that uh, within the context of this project, we have the opportunity to go into the laws that would allow that, and we have not really seen them operate, but that could allow that, which is the case, for instance, of the Colombian telecommunications law that in the case of an emergency, they can just shut down telecommunication services. 
and uh, a legally allowed shutdown that would be so against international human rights law then would become something that the state itself, uh, the state allows itself to, to enact and, and to produce. But apart from the idea of states of emergency, I think we also need to understand that regulations by states also want to allow themselves some degree of leeway to do things that would otherwise be considered against law, against human rights law, against their own constitutions, because it's understood that some special cases like combating uh, organized crime, drug trafficking, um, and so on, and, and terrorism, uh, also allow for extra powers by the state. Uh, so as much as we can identify those, as has been done in the past, but also to highlight those and how they are not up to either standards from international human rights law or by uh, standards simply set by other jurisdictions, I think we also can identify things that we can uh, advocate against uh, when those abuses are allowed. And I'm not even touching about self-regulation because in the absence of regulation, we see that uh, the, no, the rule could be some level of abuse by private actors as well. Jess, no pressure, you get the last word. <laughs> <laughs> well, my last word is, uh, so, anyway, I'm gonna say thank you to everyone and uh, because it's already 7.35 and I really have nothing to add that would, that would enhance your, your statement. So, and I'm gonna say thank you to you, Rob, for moderating us, thank and you. thank you to all of you for coming. Um, it's, you've been a great audience, and uh, yeah, thank, thank you very you much.